People who want to continue talking about open stacks of very good at what I use coffee. Thank you. Um, I've got a fairly low level uh, presentation all about the management stuff. Uh, <coughs> Specifically, KVM has some performance issues with message passion workloads. And we figured out some of the causes of this problem and have a few different potential solutions to the issue, all of which suffer from a certain degree of craziness. But it looks like one or two of them may be somewhat reasonable. And the kernel summit people I talked to over breakfast didn't kick me out. <laughs> well, first let's take a look at what exactly is a message passive workload. We're dealing with workloads that send really short messages. It spends a little bit of time processing each message. And it waits for a reply. And or it waits for the next message. And the intervals between the messages are often quite short. Messages could be arriving on the network, could be local by PC, could even be inside the process. For example, a Java process that is trying to get locks, they have many different threads, all trying to get locks at the same time. Whenever the lock is taken, they sleep until the lock is released again. Lots of workloads are affected by this. As transaction processing stuff, um, any web server talks to a database. You probably have some examples of workloads like this yourself. You can see from the simple diagram that you run for a little bit, you go idle, and you run some more. Quite simple. But it can lead to very frequent transitions between running and idle, up to several hundred thousand or even several million times a second. And any extra overhead in that path can really hurt. If you're running on a kernel on bare metal, all that really happens at this point, when we on the first transition from running to idle, is that we store the registers, we run the schedule, and we end up storing the FPU uh, registers. Sure. Kind of a misnomer right now, because all the vector operations, SSE, and a lot of other things like it, all share those same registers. And the state of those registers needs to be saved to memory. And when going back from idle to running, we restore the registers, we reload the MMU content. But we don't always have to do that. The Linux kernel has pretty good lazy MMU application. And then we also restore the FPU state, which is one of the other things that the hardware knows how to optimize out very well. The hardware knows that we just save the state and nothing touched the memory that we saved the state into, then most of the time the hardware will simply skip loading the FPU state. If we add virtualization into the mix, this transition gets somewhat more costly. We trap into the host when the guest goes by the MX system. Then the host also has to store the FPU state. And it has to do this for some reason I'll get into soon. There's no way to optimize this out. It has to update the BCPU state, run the scheduler, do all the, do all the things that are not there. And going back into the guest later on, the transition from IO to running, FPU state is optimized out again, and it will be a winter and TV clock updates, some other things like that. <coughs> what is unclear 
of course, from the seeing a list like this, is exactly where we spend the most time. What are the things that we really need to optimize on? Okay. If the switching overhead is less than the idle time, that's of course not an issue because we're done doing all the stuff that we needed to do before the next message arrives. But a really high overhead, oh, I'm sorry, a really, really high message rate for those. He really only wanted to be idle the first half of the time. But the switching overhead is quite large. And the red arrow in there is the extra time that we have to spend before we can get back to work again. And that can really slow down programming. The time in between messages can be arbitrarily short. And making any longer is, it is simply, uh, it slows things down. Now it gets even worse if you are dealing with a program that is talking to another program on the same system. Maybe in the same virtual machine on a different PC view, or in a different PC view, in a different virtual machine on the same system. If two programs that both that send each other messages and wait for each other, and they both get slowed down by the extra switching over them. Things can really slow down to an extreme when the switching overhead simply is longer than the time it takes to process a message. We've seen some instances of this happening with workloads. Particular one that we saw is a Web server talking to the database server. It's noticeably slow. <coughs> if the web server makes enough queries for every web page, it may even be visible from the web browser at times. And we have several users who have large multi threaded programs running inside KVM tests that get slowed down to maybe half of the speed that they run on bare metal, simply because of the extra overhead. That, that we have. Where is the overhead? The transition from idle to running is not that big of a deal anymore. The hardware optimizes out the restoring of the used bit. And we used to have some overhead switching into the guests. Um, the next way, PVDIO, things like that really reduced the overhead in that path. The big problem is switching from running into idle. <coughs> DMX has been optimized very nicely. And in the end, there's a lazy store of the DMX state. So that is not an issue either. The CPU is a very nice optimization to reduce the floating point, the amount of overhead spent saving and restoring the floating point. However, the optimizations do not work right across the virtualization boundary. <coughs> I'll get into that a bit more later. So this part is always slow. And the scheduler itself takes a little bit of time. It's not really stress. One of our support people has run into a particular workload where this happens to be the case. You measure the overhead of various things like by running a number of tests with the default <coughs> code, he manages to get about 135,000 transactions a second for this particular workload. Then he replaced the scheduler by simply a state hold. Tony puts the CPU into a low power saving mode with a very shallow uh, C state. And he got a slight improvement but not a whole lot. That's represented by the orange slice of the pie. It's a scheduler overhead. He then did vCPU boot, save hold, and vCPU load. The skipping floating point save. 
That turned out to be the biggest bump in performance improvement that he got. The entire yellow part of the pie is all the floating points saved and restored. I know the restore is not the issue because I wrote a patch to do the floating point restore laserly and I got exactly 0% performance improvement. The hardware optimizes that out already very nicely. So we know all of the yellow part is the floating point saved. About three quarters of the <coughs> And this some additional tests. He removed the vCPU put and load entirely, which got a very slight improvement. And he ran the yield and hold uh, disabled. So whenever the guest is idle, it keeps running the guest and it never traps into the host. It's got an additional slight improvement. That's also the best performance for a simple test, but running with yield and hold disabled is not an option for the simple reason that if I am one ABM guest running a web server and I send a message to the database server, which is another guest, and I need the database server to reply to my message, then it really helps if when I go idle, the host stops running me and runs the database. If I continue running and never trap to the host when I'm idle, then the host might not run the database, and I'm never going to get a reply. But if you, get, if you simply can get rid of the FPU overhead, and maybe some of the scheduler overhead, we should get to a performance that is fairly close to the best of The underlying cause of poor performance, as always, is optimizations. In this case, Intel and AMD have optimized their CPUs to be pretty fast when they are busy all the time, and to be low power when they're idle all the time. But they're not the best at switching between idle and running hundreds of thousands of times a second. The guest can contact switch, if it's a busy guest, can contact switch between all the processes in the guest without ever traveling to the host. The guest can also reload the FPU state for different processes inside the guest without the host ever knowing. <laughs> and this is done completely without any way of informing the host. Nothing steady inside the VMCS that the FPU state changed or anything like that. When a guest goes idle, it will call the host instruction, it traps to the host, and the host will see if something else needs the CPU. However, the host has absolutely no way to know whether or not the guest did any contact switches internally, or whether the FPU state changed. So the host always has to save the FPU state which is about three quarters of the measured overhead for this kind of workload. So what can we do here? We can see if we can avoid trapping to the host and avoiding all those contact switches, if we have short pause, we get only short pauses. To do that, we can have a very virtualized C state drive. I'll get into that in a moment. Another idea is lazy FPU switching, which Avi implemented a few years ago. To only save the FPU state when somebody else needs the FPU, or when the FPU contents are needed somewhere else. And the third idea that I'm looking at is doing contact switches more lazily. Instead of switching to the idle task, the current process which would be the VCPU thread, if it's in PP, the idle task. I start looking at the Paraport C state driver. Um, first, I will tell you what a C state driver is on bare metal, and then what's different about the virtualized things, what are the issues with it, etc. Et 
on bare metal, uh, CPUs have idle states. When the system is idle, the kernel can put the CPU to sleep. It can switch parts of the CPU off, essentially, in order to get good power saving. There are several sleep modes available. Um, the more power you save, the more parts of the CPU are switched off. And the harder it is, the longer it takes to get the system back up and running when you're no longer idle. And in order to pick the correct click state, really all you have to do is predict the future. If you can imagine, it's not always going to work click. And we don't have a generic algorithm to predict the future. But there are some reasonable things. When we get woken up, we will compare the estimated sleep time with the amount of time that you actually slept. And we will use the amount by which you were wrong to correct our future predictions. And the code seems to work fairly well on bare metal. But on bare virtualized, it will be a lot harder. And I'll get to why in a little bit. On bare metal, for an Halo, for example, there will be a table like this in a device driver, where we have the exit latency and the direct residency time, for the different power saving modes. The deeper you go on this table, the better the power saving is, but it also takes a lot longer to wake back up. From the deepest C state on Halo, the C6, it will take 200 microseconds to wake back right up. It's totally unacceptable for many workloads. But for workloads when you have shorter pauses, it will pick shorter. Uh, it will pick C states higher up on the table with shorter exit latencies. A lot of the time, we will go only down into C1 or into C3 mode. Those can still be problematic for some workloads, but there are some changes in the works to the C state driver to make it a little more intelligible, intelligent about sticking to the shallower C states when there are shorter pauses. Very virtualized would be similar, except instead of picking a CPU sleep load, we simply decide whether or not to trap into the hypervisor when we have an idle period of the guest. And the host will tell the guest how long it will take to trap into the host and get switched back into the guest if we choose that idle. But we really only have two states available. We either stay in the guest when we are idle, or we trap into the host and host can learn something else. There are some fundamental issues with this. Because we don't really know how long it will take for us to wake back up. With the hardware C state driver, we know exactly it's going to take 20 microseconds, or it's going to take 200 microseconds for that deeper mode. But if we trap to the host, the host will either switch back immediately to us, or it can choose to run another guest and switch back to us in 10 milliseconds, which is essentially forever. And since we don't know how long the host took to switch back to us, it's really difficult to, A, fill in the table that you saw before with the different modes. And it will also make it very difficult to correct for our sleep time prediction for what actually happened. Because we don't know how much sleep it actually happened with our own fault, and how much was because of the host. And the largest fundamental issue really is that if we decide to stay on the CPU because we expect to have a short pause, and there are many other VCPUs on the system that make that same decision, then the thing that we're trying to exchange messages with might not get a chance to run because everybody had decided not to trap to the host. 
And I really don't know how to how to solve that particular issue. And well, to compare these kind of tables, the, the top one is the same hardware table and for the heading. The bottom table, yeah, we <coughs> really don't know what the exit latency is or how long the pause should be before we bother trapping to the host. And when we get back, we still don't know how much time it actually was. We're going to have a really hard time getting the sleep time estimate to the right. So on to the second approach. This is something I've been implemented back in 2010. Lazy FPU switching. Instead of saving the FPU state, the memory, when we switch from a program to the IO class, we simply keep all the data in the FPU registers. And we do not save it to memory unless something else needs the FPU or the thread runs somewhere else or a debugger or something else needs access to the FPU state in memory. And only when that happens, we actually save the state to memory. It works very well if a program stays on the same FPU. When it continues running on the same FPU, we skip both the save and restore. But if the program is moved to a different FPU, then, oh sorry, to a different CPU, now that CPU is to send a message to the first CPU asking for the FPU state to be saved to memory. And only once that is done, the second CPU can load the FPU state and start running the program. This is slowed down by C states that we just went over as well. But the CPU could have gone into a fairly deep sleep state. And the program that was using the FPU, we got moved to a different CPU, it kind of start running again until after the first CPU has been woken up, saved the state to memory, and then the second CPU has loaded that state all the way from memory into its own registers. And it, it adds a little bit of complications into the FPU code, which is something that Ingo really did not like. And it's not quite clear how many workloads this would benefit versus hurt. So it's a great idea, but I don't know how we can fix some of the objections that were raised. And it is unclear the benefits of the workloads, and it was vetoed in fairly strong language. So it may be something a little bit more generic than multiple users uh, to achieve the same effect. Going back to where the overhead is, most of it is in the FPU code, but we see there is a little bit of overhead in the scheduler as well, the orange uh, part of the body. So what if we try to attack both of the two with a solution that's a little, more, a little bit more generic than just lazy FPU? I've got a few slides on that. Complex switch overhead is hurting more things than just ADM. Some of the hardware manufacturers are working on very fast, non-volatile memory. And in certain use cases, they use that as a block device. It's essentially the speed of a RAM disk. And the current I.O. stack in Linux is really built for devices that take forever to handle on memory request. When you finally a request, the program goes to sleep, and at some point in the far future, your hard disk tells you that the I.O. completed, and the program is woken back up. But if you have a device that can do several million I.O. operations a second, suddenly the context switch overhead is an issue. Hey, we <coughs> have a second use case out there. It has an issue with context switches. Maybe it has some infrastructure that's possible that can solve both cases. And that will hopefully make it more acceptable for the code to be merged in the kernel. 
So the idea is that instead of switching to the idle task, we can allow any task to become the idle task by calling a simple function in the kernel. It can help reduce or even avoid the context switch overhead for short sleeps. And by doing this in scheduler code, it will allow us to do the same things that idle tasks do. We can look around the system to see if there is something else that actually needs the CPU right now. If the scheduler sees us and it has something else to run later on, it can wake us up and replace us with something that really needs to run. And we can even do power saving on longer states. We can do all the things that happen in an idle task. But if we are a message passing workload, then we can simply skip the context switch overhead, both on the transition from running to idle and on the way back from idle to running. Um, I'm working on some code for this right now. Right now, the prototype should be a little bit like this. We have an idle call function and a structure that contains info for the idle call function. And we call idle call, uh, we pass it a, a function pointer to a call function, which is a little confusing in the name. We probably have to change that before posting the patches. And that whole function does things that the idle task does. Or you can replace it with your own. If you already know <coughs> that your sleep is going to be extremely short, you have the option of using your own whole function. Task state needs to be saved on preemption. If we act as an idle thread and somebody else needs to run instead, then we need to make sure that all the states that we have in the registers and in the FPU, in the MMU, and all the other parts of the CPU are properly saved to memory. Luckily, the kernel already has infrastructure that does this. It's called the preamp notifiers. KVM is using this already. And there is no need at all to introduce new code for this. It keeps the other whole mechanism very small. And the function that calls by the calls of KVM, that will be KVM VCPU block, is called whatever the VCPU got idle. It already adds the process to its own weight queue, which will make it easy to wake it back up by VCPU pick when it happens from someone else. So all of this code can stay the same as it was before. It's a bit of an advantage to trying to get something big and complicated first. At least, I can keep it small and complicated. For KVM case, there really isn't a whole lot of status that we need to check. The only thing that the whole function needs to check is did the task have woken up? And we have a mechanism to see that. We can simply check the task state. We can change our own task state to an interruptible sleep before calling the idle call function. And we can check whether we got whether the state got switched back to run because we were woken up by CCPU pick or something else. This is a very generic way of implementing this. The others could use the same idle call function as well. Just my making this the default function. And well, if there's another task that needs to run, we simply do all the same things that we do right now um, from context switching. If nothing else wants to run before we run back, we do nothing at all, which is really low of The workflow of a context switch with this code. If the CPU stays idle if, until the original thread is runnable again, what we really have to do is mark the task is running and you avoid it all the overtime. At wake up time, 
we do need to make sure that the task is woken up on the same CPU where it is still running. It will require a few changes to the scheduling code. Um, basically, disabling the way to find logic for, for these tasks. But it should be only a few lines of code. And it might even result in better locality than what we've had so far for the schedule. If something else needs to run on the CPU, then we simply preempt the threat in the same way that we've always done with the VM notifiers, which point you have to use to get saved. All the usual slow stuff happens. But it only happens if something else needs to run while we are idle. There are some trade-offs in this, of course. If we're lucky and for measure to pass in the workloads, we look at what those systems do. It seems like the vast majority of times we are indeed lucky like this. And we can avoid doing a lot of expensive things like saving the FPU split. And if something else needs to run, the infrastructure is in place to switch to the other program. But it does break a very old Unix tradition that the idle task is process ID zero. It adds a little bit of code to the scheduler, which means I should probably head over to the kernel summit at some point and fight Peter. But that should also be doable. Um, but the biggest issue with this is instead of saving the FPU state when we go idle and nothing else wants to see you, we delay doing a very expensive operation until somebody else wants to see you. So somebody else is going to have to wait for us to save the FPU state when, when it wants to run. It may work out a lot of the time but there is a potential worst case here where we go idle for a little bit, something else wants to run, and that something else cannot run yet because we first have to save the FPU state before we're able to make the switch to the other task. So we may need some heuristic in the kernel to, to see how often we switch back to the original task versus how often we switch to something else. And do the FPU save lazily or regularly, depending on what is going on. On the other hand, maybe we don't need this at all, and I can avoid adding that code later on. So once I have more more code to test this with, I'll know for sure what we're going to need. The only conclusion we can draw from this presentation is that message passing workloads are quite hard to deal with because every single one of the solutions that I proposed have program bases. And the system is certainly not optimized very well for switching between running and idle steps. Very first is data driver. Um, the source code changes that we need for this are very isolated, neatly isolated from the rest of the system. We need no changes in the core of the kernel, but it has some fundamental issues, and it's really not clear whether or not those are solvable. It is in FPU switching. It, it works very well, but it is very sort of a special purpose modification to code that the people are very sensitive about and have spend a lot of time on them. And it does have the potential worst case that I'm also not entirely sure how to solve. The lazy context switching, it has multiple users, but it needs some fundamental changes to the scheduler code, which will no doubt lead to all kinds of lively debates on the Linux kernel mailing list. But it's the approach that I think would be the most generic right now and probably not require too many invasive changes in the code. It's, it's what I'm playing with right now. And 
Stay tuned for the fireworks on the next Earl Mayan. Since all these ideas have downsides, I'm not looking just for questions, but if you have a suggestion for better ideas, I'm always welcome to that as well. Thank you. Um, is there likely to be a hardware Now the question is, is there any talk of hardware optimization to make this problem go away? Um, I have not heard of one. And if you were to talk with a company like Intel or AMD today, it would probably take at least five years for one of our suggestions to show up in hardware. And I think that we're going to need a solution between now and then, either way. Of course, once we fix it in software, then we're going to need to do it in hardware. Bit of a catch-22 there. I suspect the best thing is to simply solve it in software right now. Uh, um, whether or not we switch from the guest to the host when we go idle, um, it's determined by, I believe it's a that was re removed from KVM since it's a whole time idle uh, parameter. And when the guest goes idle, it calls the whole instruction. And at that point, the hardware will simply trap to the host. But I think this is a flag in the theorem's yes, that can be set by the amount of Sorry, I, I didn't. My question wasn't uh, When we switch between tasks, we then yes. So, uh, so the FDU the context changes. But you said that we don't know yes. whether that happened, and this is the reason that we need to take the FDU context. Yeah, true. In the host, we cannot see whether the guest changed the FPU space or even whether the guest used the FPU at all. But that's the guest, uh, guest Linux model. I'm not sorry. So maybe the guest can tell us using the model set. The guests. I guess we could kind of virtualize this and have the guest tell the host whether the FPU was used. But it's not just the FPU that uses those registers. All of the SSD instructions, for example, use those same registers. And a lot of mem copy and, and um, checksumming, encryption functions, all kinds of things like that use those registers. So the chances of the register being used when you're dealing with the workload that sends messages to other programs, actually quite a lot. Any other questions? Thank you.